Welcome to Smyrna Presbyterian's morning worship. So great to meet with you today. I wanted to speak to a couple of things before we start. One is that I'm sitting here in this room, which is where our food bank is, where our food distribution takes place. And this past time we gave out ample boxes of food for 45 families. Incredible achievement for a church like us. Many people in this community are going to have food and might not have had food otherwise. So even though we're having limited things going on in our church, um, good things are happening and we are being a blessing to the community. I also wanted to mention the fact that I know many of you, like we are, are heartbroken over the limiting of activities this summer. We decided to close the pool for the summer and also postpone some of our activities. I know this has been hard for all of you, for a lot of you, not to have camp meeting, not to have, uh, uh, not to have camp meeting, and not to have VBS, and to postpone those things till the fall. I know it's been heartbreaking for many of you, and it is for us too. But I sure for assure you that for our church leaders, it was solely a decision made for the safety our members and our visitors. We can't wait till we get going again, hopefully in the fall, and begin to meet with each other as we normally do. I hope that you'll keep this in mind and that you'll hang in there as we continue to do ministry in the midst of this pandemic. And now let us worship the Lord. People of Smyrna, will you join with me in the confession of sins using the words in your bulletin? Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, in word, and in deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, what we have been, help us in amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Lord, hear our prayer. We are forgiven, we are loved, not because we tried real hard, not because we did something special, not because we believed the right thing or thought the right thing. We are forgiven because of who Jesus Christ is, because of the love of God that is given unconditionally to all of us. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen.
And so it is told of two guys running as fast as they can through the jungle. Apparently they're being pursued by a lion. Suddenly the first one stops and removes his street shoes and puts on a pair of lightweight track shoes. The other fellow is aghast because the lion is quickly approaching. And he says, how can you stop like this and, and take the time to put these track shoes on? And the other one replied, well, you see, I don't have to under outrun the lion. I only have to outrun you. I know that's the way a lot of you are feeling. Sometimes you're feeling like something's pursuing you. Uh, it's trying to catch up to you. But the truth is, God's really in charge and he loves you. And he will care for you in the midst of everything that's going on with you. Here now, God's word is from the second chapter of Ruth, this wonderful novella that's in the Bible of everyday life about the providence and love and guidance of God. So here now, the second chapter. Now, Naomi had a kinsman on her husband's side, a prominent rich man of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain behind someone in whose sight I may find favor. She said to her, Go, my daughter. So she went, and she came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. As it happened, she came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz, just then, Boaz, from Bethlehem, he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, To whom does this young woman belong? The servant, who was in charge of the reapers, answered, She is the Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please, let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. So she came, and she has been on her feet from early this morning until now, without resting even for a moment. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to, the, to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field, on the field that is being reaped, and follow behind them. I have ordered the young men not to bother you. If you get thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Then she fell prostrate with her face to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that I, that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds, and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, Oh, may I continue to find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and, my Lord, and spoken kindly to your servant, even though I am not one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here. And eat some of this bread, and dip your morsel in the sour wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he heaped up her heap up on her plate some parched grain. She ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she got up to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, Let her glean even among the standing sheaves, and do not reproach her. You must also put it, pull some out, some handfuls out for her from the bundles and leave them for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and was about an ipa, ipa of barley. She picked up and came into the town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gleaned. Then she took out and gave her what was left over, and she herself had been satisfied. Her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he by the Lord, whose kindness is not, has not forsaken the living 
or the dead. Naomi also said to her, This man is a relative of ours, one of our nearest kin. And Ruth the Moabite said, He even said to me, Stay close to my servants until they have finished all my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is better, my daughter, that you go out with his young women. Otherwise, you might be bothered in another field. So she stayed close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, thank you for the truth that's here. May we find ourselves a part of what's happening. Would you teach us about yourself and your plans for us? This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The situation here is pretty clear from last week. You remember that Ruth and that uh, Naomi and her husband, well, they were troubled by difficult harvests. And so they went to Moab, Moab to gather new, better harvest. And along the way, he passed away and the two sons that they had passed away also. And so Ruth and Naomi and, and Oprah were together. And at first, they, both ladies wanted to go with them, and then they decided not to, and, and only Naomi stuck with her. And we learned a lot about a commitment. We learned a lot about Hesed. We learned a little bit about providence, and that's what we'll talk about more today. For you see, what are the odds that of all the families that lived in Bethlehem and all the fields that were tilled in the area, that Ruth would be gleaning in the field of a kinsman? In the first verse, we find out that this is going to happen. The very person who could help her the most, that's the field that they began to glean in. It was circumstances came together. Was it just luck or coincidence? Uh, we don't believe that's the case. We believe that this was a part of the providence of God. God put this together. Now, you may think that the providence of God has to do with God controlling events. God making things happen, God taking away even our free will. But we know that providence is not that at all. Providence has to do with God working in our lives with a plan. It has to do with our relationship with Him. It has to do with our ability to live in fellowship with one another and with Him. It's a covenant relationship that goes on that begins right there in this idea of providence. Sometimes it's really hard to understand providence. Uh, but I like to use two examples that help me a lot. The first is the old one about uh, a tapestry. On the back of the tapestry, there seems to be just loose threads, coincidences, crazy things, things that are unrelated, a mystery of things. The back of a tapestry makes no sense. But then you turn, around, turn it around and see that it makes a beautiful picture. That all those threads that we thought were unintentional and random and nowhere nowhere near making anything, have come together on the other side to be a beautiful tapestry. And so I believe that's what providence is. That's the way God's plans work out. We don't see exactly how they do that, but they do work out in the end. And God has a plan for his children. The other example I like to use is, well, there's a ship going. and That ship has a specific destination. It's going on a cruise. It's going from here to there. If it's not a part of the pandemic situation. It makes a, a beeline to these different places and then turns around and goes back. There's a plan that this ship has. But also there are things going on on the ship. It's not like there's nothing happening. All kinds of activities are going on. All kinds of decisions are being made by the captain. All kinds of relationships are being built. As the ship moves from one destination to another, there's a plan going on, but also on the ship, the people are exercising their freedom all the time. They're making decisions. They're doing those things that come together to make providence work. That's especially true in this story. If you think about Ruth, Ruth was making decisions and doing things and putting herself in a position where God would work. Her first thing was she said that she was going to glean in a field where she might find favor. So her intention was to put herself in a place where she might be blessed. She was doing more than gathering food. She had an intention that she was going to do 
be a part of God's plan. And so she made a plan to go to the, to the, to the fields and to pick up the gleanings and prayed that that might be in a situation where she would find favor. Not only did she have a high expectation, a high intention, but she worked hard. As she was fitting into the plans that God had for her, she worked hard. She worked so hard that she stood out among all the other workers. And she worked from morning till night. She was working hard too and being a good daughter-in-law to her mother. She had gotten a good reputation in the community and a good reputation there on the, on the threshing field because she worked very hard. To be a part of God's providence, we have to work hard being about His business. It's not just something that comes to us um, automatically in an automatic way. No, God uses the things that we do. He uses our intentions. He uses our actions to make things happen. And finally, God uses her humility. She doesn't glean from the field and claims her rights to do so. She humbly asks the other workers for permission. And then when she talks to her, her friend, uh, friend Boaz, she talks about, uh, she talks humbly to him. Is grateful for what's happening to her. Is not claiming her rights in any way. She humbly receives what Boaz gives. And so it is that by doing these three things, by having an intention, by working hard, and by having humility, the things that we do help bring providence to bear. And so as we look at the situation that we're in right now, uh, we see that we're in a difficult situation. But we must have no doubt that God's providence is in action. And in the midst of the pandemic, we must not freeze up. We must not stop we must continue to act on what God tells us to do. We need to have an intention about what we do. We need to work hard at it. And we need to know that we, are, we have no reason to claim these things, to have humility. And if we do those three things, then what we do fits in with what God's providence is for us. Isn't that a wonderful and good thing? In the midst of these things that seem to be unanswerable, these, these crazy threads of our life, there's a tapestry being woven. And in the midst of our, our ship going to a destination off in the future that God plans, on that ship we have decisions to make and things to do for God's providence to work out. Boaz prays a prayer for a Ruth that she would find favor and that, that God's wings would cover her up and that she would be protected. The prayer of Boaz uh, this prayer about the wings, is that, that idea is found all the way through the Old Testament where God is like an eagle whose wings are spread over the nest of the eagles, where the small ones and the weak ones, where they, where they live, where they're not ready to go out into the world, that there's protection there. And so he prays for Ruth that she would have these wings covering her and protecting her. So in the midst of the things that are going on, Know that God has a plan and that God is putting his wings over you to protect you and sustain you. It's not that you might not uh, become ill or might not have struggles with family and might not have problems. But know in the midst of God's providence, there is also his care for you. Well, when I was in college, I had this opportunity to go to Virginia Beach to do a mission project. I was involved with a group called InterVarsity and they had a project where you would meet people during the day and invite them to a coffee house and there'd be an evangelistic musician there and you would sit down at tables and get to know people and talk to them about the gospel. It was a great chance for me to grow in sharing my faith. But there was also another thing that happened. I made the decision to do that, but then God's providence came into play. One day we were going across to a planning meeting across a busy highway and suddenly this young woman passed me by on a bicycle and I was standing next to a person who lived in Virginia Beach and they waved at each other and I knew that they were friends and I'd become friends with this young lady and that was a part of our group. And I said, could you tell me who that is? She's absolutely beautiful. And my friend and her friend said to me, I know exactly who she is. And she's not only beautiful on the outside, she's beautiful on the inside. And I know that you would like to meet her. Now, what are the odds that a guy from uh, 
Atlanta, Georgia, Macon, Georgia, uh, would, would go across the country to Virginia Beach, Virginia, and be crossing that street with that friend who lived in Virginia Beach, who knew this person who was on a bicycle, crossing over that street. What are the odds that that would happen? And they're very, very high, I'll tell you. But do you know who that person was on the bicycle? It was my future wife, Linda. So what I thought was just common everyday circumstances in the midst of doing a good thing that God had called me to do, God's providence was working its way into my life. And at that point in time, I met the person that would be my future wife. So not only am I grateful to God, but I'm grateful to this woman who decided to be my wife. How wonderful it's been that she's shared my ministry with me over the years. And it's true, she's even more beautiful on the inside and the out than she used to be. And so brothers and sisters, know that providence is at work. That God has a plan. Know that your part needs to be done too so that you participate in the providence of God and take comfort in this difficult time that God is with you. And may God bless you this day. heard the word read and proclaimed, so let us say what it is that we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Join with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the, resur and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray a pastoral prayer together. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for all that you have done for us. I thank you so much that your love is never ending. I thank you so much that you're at work in this broken world. I know that people are suffering. I know that they are struggling and hurt. I know that many are dying even. And Lord, I know your heart is broken even as mine is. And so Lord, I do pray that you would bring healing into the lives of many of those people. And that people might come to know you for the first time and have the comfort of their salvation. And Lord, that people would be delivered from this sickness and that they might give testimony to how you have taken care of them. There's no mistake in this happening the way it is in this time. God's providence is being played out. He has things to teach us. He has things for us to do. So Lord, we do pray, Lord, that you would help us to listen and you would help us to hear what it is that you want us to be doing to participate in this plan. And when we grow weary or when we become confused and when we wonder what's going on, help us know deep within ourselves that you are good and that you love us and that you will never let us go. Lord, we thank you for that prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. 
Week after week, you, the people of Smyrna, have so faithfully sat in these pews and passed the offering plate. Week after week, you give, and you give faithfully. And yet, even though you can't sit in these pews anymore, you still continue to give generously and faithfully. And for that, I give thanks. Glory be to God. People of Smyrna, it is time to break out your checkbooks and write your tithes to the church. Will you join with me in prayer? Lord, we offer up to you these gifts this money, these offerings, and we offer up to you our very selves. Take away our will and replace it with your will, Lord. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Go from this place with the sheer conviction that God loves you and that God's plan is unfolding. And as you go, may the love of the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit go with you, both now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen.